Well, you know, Simon said he wasn't um, a <coughs> political scientist, but anybody who puts up there the New Deal and Carl Polanyi uh, is a political scientist in, in my book. Um, you know, I'm the last person at this conference, and um, I barely am going to speak about the EU. Um, so um, I, I rewrote this several times as I kept hearing things, so I hope you'll all hear parts of your presentation. Um, one of the things, do I have my glasses? I know. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is the fact that we've had a lot of comparisons um, with the EU um, and the US, and a lot of it has looked at the past. Think about Sergio's work in terms of comparative federalism. And there's been an awful lot of work on comparative um, US-EU relations, not just transatlantic, but looking at the durable shift in political authority and governance, looking in terms of identity politics or welfare state formation, sovereignty and statehood, or even sort of um, federalism and market relations. And what we're really interested in is how we shift from singular states to unions. And so um, most of us have tended to focus on the institutional design of federalism. And if we do make any historical reference, it's usually in terms of how the US created new forms of government with the framers. But the framers were also concerned with the development and working character of market institutions. And going back to Polanyi. Um, and so American market capitalism was very profoundly and continually linked to the constitutional structure and the institutional design of the American state or states. And so what I'm interested in is looking at uh, the evolution of the European single market and comparing it to 19th century market making, state building, and democracy in the United States. And I think it provides a useful analogy. And so I put up there, these are the kind of questions that you, talking about the future of Europe, would be very interested in. Not just how do you get, make markets, but also what accounts for the political success and failure, which uh, Hans talked about. What about the institutional rules and norms to promote and legitimize market integration, particularly as it's so politicized and contested? What kind of compensatory mechanisms do you want for market integration uh, to advance it? And then can social discontent threaten market integration with the populist backlash? If you had all of those questions, you could say, I can apply those to the EU. I'm going to apply them to the United States. And because I think there's a lot of analogies and parallels, and in light of this conference, what lessons or experience or models or challenges does the US American experience provide in the 19th century? And so I think there are some striking analogies, and you can probably apply these questions to your own, your own work. And so I'm fully aware that in comparing antebellum and postbellum America with contemporary post-war Europe, you're going to say, yes, there are plenty of differences. Inter-industry trade wasn't existent in the EU. You have the issue of slavery and property rights. There are plenty of differences in uncommon markets. But I want to focus on the commonalities and just to highlight a few for you, some of which are more obvious than others. First of all, I think both disperse power widely. Both engage in intergovernmental cooperation and both implement, you know, as it's a collective exercise of government authority in terms of implementation, both state and federal. Secondly, both started off as customs unions and both moved towards single markets. Uh, note the word move. And the, they also started off as agrarian economies, both engaged in economic modernization, which is, you know, with very different regions at different levels of economic development, just as we had in the United States between the West, the, nor the, West, the North, and the South. And they also had legal frameworks for a single market, which were a mixture of express provisions and exceptions in terms of how you make markets. And so they also had very big territorial differences uh, and had tensions between localism and concentration. And they also had tensions between debtor-creditor relations, which we heard today. And they also had a mixture and an aggregate of very different market ideologies. And so in looking at that and to sort of, you know, and they also had multiple currencies. I partly live in Maryland and we had over 16 to 20 currencies in the 19th century. 
And, um, but they were also very different, going back to Philip Genschel's, in the sense their extractive capacity. The tax impact at the federal level was very minimal in the early US. States, constituent units, had their own independent fiscal policies as well as multiple currencies, not dissimilar to the early EU. And so, um, and so in thinking about this, you know, thinking about what Philip said, the federal government focused on tariffs, land management, monetary policy, but it didn't require a substantive fiscal or administrative resources or capacity. And so the overall impact of tax and revenue policy in the 19th century was very minimal at the federal level. And the last thing that's very interesting about these commonalities is what we tend to forget that when you enlarge in the EU, you are treated in a very symmetrical fashion when you join. Maybe your institutional rules and voting is different, but that's like the United States. The Northwest Ordinances in 1787 made the original 13 plus any others be treated equally. And I think we tend to forget that in terms of the importance in terms of how states were treated in a single market. And so, in thinking about all of this, uh, the process of market integration in the United States, don't forget it was contentious. There were significant periods of mass mobilization, agrarianism, populism, and there were also opposition to changing economic uh, conditions and dislocation. And there was also sectional conflict. Perhaps, you know, we don't call it north-south, but there was sectional conflict that shaped the nature of industrialization. And so we produced growing economic inequality in the United States, and there were very deliberate um, sort of tensions and exclusions along race, ethnic, class, and territorial lines. We heard a lot about class cleavages here, but we didn't hear a lot about ethnic, race, and um, uh, ethnic and racial lines, but there were very big territory, uh, big differences and cleavages in the United States, and I would argue creating asymmetrical integration. And so the United States needed to address what we would take for granted in Europe. They wanted to address the growing complexity, dependency, and anonymity of markets. And they were wrestling with the growing uh, problems emerging from um, sort of private economic power, but also the dilemmas of uneven economic development. The South still sticking to slavery and a dependent economy versus a changing economy in the West and a very different financial economy in the Northeast. And so in collectively knitting these together, these economies into broader territorial units, they engaged in something that um, Adrienne would be very familiar with, and that was they engaged in market correcting policies, market regulating policies, and market facilitating policies. And if you look at what the United <coughs> States did to create a single market, this is exactly what we talk about in the United States, uh, whether it's standardizing weights and measures, antitrust laws, or government ownership and control regulatory agencies. So there is a pattern of how that market was constructed. And so not only is, do I see market coordination measures have some parallels, but I also see the instruments, because you also look at instruments when you look at market integration. And these should be very familiar to, US, uh, to European specialists. Hans Miklas talked about harmonization, and most of us know that it wasn't successful in the single market. The United States had a uniform state movement in the 19th century that was equally unsuccessful. Just like the EU, it also engaged in mutual recognition and reciprocity. But there's something different about the American model of mutual recognition and reciprocity. It's discriminatory. In the United States, it's partial. So I'm from uh, Washington, D.C., and if I wanted to be a lawyer and practice law, I would only be able to practice in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. If I had an interstate compact, it's regional. The idea that we would exclude California and New York from legal practice wouldn't happen you know, in the European. You would expect all 28 to be subject to mutual recognition. So we have partial reciprocity and mutual recognition. But these are the same kinds of modes of governance that we have in the, United St in, in the EU. So I do want to talk about that. But then there were three elements of that market that I thought fitted Adrienne's work very well. 
The first one is the United States also used informal modes of cooperation or non-hierarchical joint decision making is what I heard here. And one of the things they tried to do is reduce information costs. And there was the growth of accumulated capital in the 19th century, but how do you ensure that the West has good credit in an emerging economy? <coughs> and one of the things, how do you create interbank lending when you've got restrictions? And one of the issues they created was an informal network of um, financial intermediaries known as the Suffolk system very much an informal model to get around rules, restrictions, and barriers. So on the one hand, I see Adrienne in the single market in current uh, banking lending and financial intermediaries. The second area I see Adrienne is a regulatory patchwork because in some areas, particularly services, we still have 50 sets of rules and regulations, particularly in professional services, occupational services. It's not always rational. It's not always an allocation of competences that is um, rational, and oftentimes it's the product of interest group mobilization. What's interesting then is that the single market is actually incomplete in the United States in services. And it's asymmetrical as well in terms of policy. It's often forgotten that we have market participant exemptions in the United States. It's total protectionism. If you want to purchase through public procurement in Oregon, you have to buy Oregon printing. If you want to buy mulch, in Pennsylvania, it has to be Pennsylvanian mulch. And we tend to forget the incompleteness of the American single market. And so what changes, what lessons, what ideas could the US provide for the EU? Um, that's terrible to see. It's not meant to sound sort of hegemonic. Um, it's just meant to sort of reflect on, I've heard all of this about Europe today uh, for two days, and I'm thinking many of the debates that I heard are about disunion, contentious politics, fiscal policy, debt restrictions, democratic legitimacy, and challenges of new technologies or new instruments. And I thought, oh, well, I can fit everything into 19th century America. And so I thought I would give just two examples for you to reflect on and think about the United States. The first one, and I took uh, Adrienne's work as my guide. The first one is the debt crisis, and the second one is social welfare, public policy, and service public. I thought I would pick yours. Um, in terms of the debt crisis, the single market's under stress. Simon laid that out in terms of the issues. The US experience also experienced a debt crisis in the 19th century with debt defaults and debt limits. And the effect shaped the institutional allocation of powers. The US created new administrative capacities, new policy instruments, and it curbed the fiscal autonomy of states. Make no mistake about it, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Indiana defaulted on their debt. And they could not have access to capital. And it took them a long time to do that. And so they imposed, the states themselves imposed constitutional restrictions on their own and adopted them in their own constitutions. It started off in the North, and then when the South got into fiscal problems, they also adopted constitutional amendments. And so what was interesting about that is they put a lot of pressure on the federal government to assume their debt. And so the US adopted these legal and constitutional amendments to restrict state borrowing, and it stimulated both defaults and institutional innovation, but it did something else. Your first book was about local governments and municipalities. In the United States, we have Dillon's rule that's supposed to make local government creatures of the state. One of the things that happened is that once the state had constitutional debt limits, federal governments then stepped in and started raising credit for capital improvements, railroads, and everything else. Local governments circumvented state debt limitations and created new institutional innovations called public authorities, special districts, and actually raised their own uh, fiscal um, uh, fiscal uh, revenue. So they, the circumvention or subterfuge is also there. And so what's interesting is what did these states do to pay off their debt? Um, well, property rights, 
taxes on banks, um, occupational licensing, and in some cases, they also sold off public enterprises. I hope that sounds a little familiar. Um, and so the debt restrictions are very, very important. And so I, I say that as a caveat because I think it's a very interesting uh, analogy with um, the United States uh, and the EU. The second area, and then I'm closing, is social welfare, social policies, and public services, which is also Adrienne's area. There's been a strong emphasis in the EU to social Europe. And it's the important welfare state at the national level, and then the concerns about Fritz Sharp on constitutional asymmetry, a la Viking, Laval, and um, Ruffert. The US is always considered a welfare laggard, and so I think that's uh, a fair comment. But there are two things. The first one is Mayone. The United States in the 19th century did not do social welfare policy, it did social regulation, a well-regulated society, municipalities, localities, and uh, other areas and statutes in, munici uh, in terms of health, safety, workplace, and sanitation. It was a highly regulated society, so it fits very much Mayone's model. But the second thing is, and finally, is that we didn't have the here is where the public interest comes in. The issue of social protection and the idea of labor unionization and minimum wage was actually struck down by the US Supreme Court as contrary to market integration. The Lochner era, the commercial republic, the government could not intervene. It could not favor certain social interests, even labor unions, even promoting a minimum wage, since such market adjustments benefited specific groups and it did not serve the broader public purpose. I'll end there because my time is running out and I'm happy to take questions. But I hope that, um, you know, that maybe your next book can be on the American single market. Thank you.